Even in the context of North Korea, the report's still made for pretty shocking reading. Released last week by Human Rights Watch, a sense of terror stronger than a bullet, the closing of North Korea, is one of those blockbuster pieces of analysis that everybody should be talking about. A highly detailed account of life inside the Hermit Kingdom backed up with satellite data and extensive eyewitness interviews. Over 148 pages, the team laid out how Kim Jong-un's regime has transformed since the COVID-19 pandemic, becoming increasingly brutal and erratic, to the point where even the elites and army are suffering deprivation. But while we'll cover some of the draconian new laws later in this segment of the show, there was one conclusion in the report that stood out above all others. After decades of relative porousness, North Korea appears to have sealed its border with China. This might seem surprising. After all, Beijing is Pyongyang's only official ally, the sole support keeping the entire rotten edifice from collapsing. It's Chinese trade that keeps the DPRK just about ticking over, Chinese food that keeps ordinary North Koreans the right side of starvation. Yet there's no doubting the satellite evidence included in the report, evidence that builds on earlier reporting by Reuters that we also used for this video. Along the 1,400 kilometers joining China to North Korea, new obstacles and guard posts are appearing. New infrastructure that has turned the DPRK's northern border into one almost as impenetrable as this border with South Korea. Take the fences. In satellite photos from 2019, both the Human Rights Watch and Reuters reports show multiple border regions where there used to be either just a single razor wire fence or no fence. At all. Look at photos from 2022 or 2023, though, and multiple new layers of fencing have appeared. There's a primary fence to stop people breaking through, followed by a secondary fence, and in some cases, even a third. Between these fences, new patrol paths have appeared for guards, dotted along them are likewise new observation points to see anyone approaching, ranging from simple two-man guard posts that are little more than shacks to watchtowers and garrisons. According to Human Rights Watch quoting here, a total of 6,820 facilities have been placed near new or improved fences, an average of one every 110 meters. That is a massive increase from just a few years ago. The BBC reports that in 2019, there were just 38 guard posts dotted along the border with China. Today, there are thousands of them. Minefields too, while invisible on satellite, have been reported by defectors. On top of that, the authorities have apparently instituted buffer zones, areas close to the border where guards have orders to shoot to kill any human or animal approaching. Even on a militarized frontier like that separating the two Koreas, such measures would be heavy-handed. Yet the new border controls in the north aren't to keep China from attacking or floods of Chinese civilians from crossing illegally into the DPRK's socialist paradise. Rather, they are there to keep ordinary North Koreans trapped inside, to ensure that Kim Jong-un's subjects become his prisoners. As Reuters has put it, quoting again, for North Koreans, the country's northern frontier long offered rare access to outside information, trade opportunities, and the best option for those seeking to flee. But as the pandemic gripped the world in 2020, Kim Jong-un's regime embarked on a massive exercise to seal its borders with China and Russia. The role of the pandemic here is really important. While Chinese trade with North Korea slowed after Beijing agreed to sanction Pyongyang over nuclear tests in 2016 and 2017, it's really only as COVID-19 emerged that the border crackdown really began. In early January 2020, Kim Jong-un became the first leader on Earth to order his nation's borders closed to stop the spread of the virus. Since he was soon followed by most other countries, at the time it didn't really seem like that much of an extreme reaction. But while those other countries would spend the next couple of years walking a tightrope between containing the virus and trying to uphold civil liberties, Pyongyang took a different approach. Under the guise of pandemic restrictions, Kim Jong-un embarked on perhaps the worst crackdown on society in his nation's history. Now, since this is North Korea we're talking about, you might be thinking that sounds a touch hyperbolic. After all, it's not like Pyongyang was famous for its commitment to civil liberties before 2020. But this is a rare case when it's nearly impossible to exaggerate. As the border with China was sealed, Kim also worked to seal his people off from the outside world, not just physically, but mentally and spiritually. On the practical side, this meant cracking down on all unsanctioned economic activity, no matter how low level. Back in the 1990s, widespread famine essentially led to the collapse of the North Korean state. Unable to fulfill even basic functions, the regime opted to turn a blind eye to private economic activity that was also useful. Black markets began to spring up. Smugglers established networks to bring staple goods from China. People opened unlicensed restaurants in their own homes. Because this stuff was technically capitalist in nature, it did remain illegal. 
But agents of the states accepted bribes to turn the other way, and the punishments remained relatively lax. Fines or a month's imprisonment, that sort of thing. The pandemic laws, they swept all of that away. Low-level officials were suddenly being executed for taking bribes. It became a serious criminal offense to distribute food or operate a restaurant. Even catching fish in a river could result in being sent to a work camp for life, lest you try and sell your catch. And travel restrictions meant smugglers couldn't even leave their own villages. Combined with new border infrastructure and shoot-to-kill orders plus curfews that lasted from sundown to sunrise, the result was a sudden shock end to the black market networks that had been keeping ordinary North Koreans' heads above water. With those last lifelines cut, the population immediately sank into the depths of a nightmare. The immediate impact was a sharp spike in the price of essentials. In America and Europe, we've all spent the last year complaining about inflation. But without ignoring the hardship that it caused working families here in the West, inflation in North Korea was simply on another level. The numbers Human Rights Watch give are staggering. Rice went from the equivalent of $14 for a 20 kilo bag in 2019 to over $40 in 2022. Five liters of cooking oil went from seven to over $70. Now, $70 for cooking oil would be horrendous even here in Europe, where people have things like salaries and savings. These are alien concepts to North Koreans. But in the DPRK, it was just one part of a feedback loop of suffering. With all adult males and unmarried women forced to work for the state for a pittance, North Korean families traditionally get money to buy staples by sending the wife out to do some black market selling or smuggling or other low-level economic activity. But with the crackdown on these activities coming just as goods stopped flowing across the Chinese border, most families were hit with a double whammy of skyrocketing prices and plunging incomes. And the inevitable result? Starvation. 2023 saw Asia Press report that whole families were starving to death in urban areas of North Korea. Last summer, the BBC detailed how even in the elite city of Pyongyang, people were being found dead of starvation in their apartments. According to the UN, the fraction of the population suffering food insecurity rose to nearly half. The US estimated it was closer to 70%. With government rations cancelled, even some of the elites apparently went hungry. Up at the border, the same soldiers ordered to shoot the smugglers apparently ran out of food in places like Chagan province. Even amid all of this, though, the government didn't ease up on the repression. Instead, it began to target a new frontier, the population's mines. A slew of laws brought in from December 2020 to January 2023 tried to stop starving North Koreans even thinking that things might be better elsewhere. One banned watching or distributing foreign shows, primarily smuggled dramas from South Korea, which used to be sold in black markets. Another forbid young people from copying foreign culture. A third made it illegal to use South Korean slang. Again, the punishments for breaking these laws were not minor. The Human Rights Watch report details the public executions of teenagers in Haisen City who were caught watching South Korean movies. Others were sent to the regime's notoriously brutal prison colonies for life. At this point, you might have a pretty obvious question. Why? Why would a regime, even as evil as North Korea's, actively attempt to starve its own people and seal the border with its one ally? The answer is as depressing as it is sadistic to control them. To gain a level of control so total that even thinking about rebelling would become impossible. When Pyongyang turned a blind eye to the emergence of black markets following the catastrophic famine of the 1990s, it inevitably meant ceding control of some elements of society. Things like access to information and parts of the economy. As the state retreated, new power bases began to emerge. Reuters documents the rise of the Donju, a name that literally translates as masters of money, but who we'd probably call entrepreneurs. These were the black marketeers who used their connections and business sense to get vital food to ordinary people and make some money doing so. Basically, these guys were what passed for a North Korean middle class prior to 2020. But it seems their rising prosperity became a potential threat to Kim Jong-un. It may be that the pandemic crackdowns were an attempt to break the Donju, regardless of the effect that it had on the wider population that relied on them. Speaking to Reuters, the vice president at the Council on Diplomacy for Korean Unification opined that the sealed border may have likewise aimed to stop rival power bases arising in the military. Often living in Pyongyang, the military elites are so far from the Chinese border that they rely on networks to bring them smuggled goods. But take out those networks, and potential rivals to Kim become wholly reliant on the government to obtain anything from luxury items to basic necessities. It could be that Kim's end goal was to make the elite too dependent on his largesse to ever challenge him. 
Away from the elites and the Donju, it's likely that sealing the border also served one final purpose, stopping ordinary people from escaping. Fleeing North Korea via China was always tough, with Beijing more than happy to return any escapees to Pyongyang for punishment. But it was possible, and people managed it. Alongside all the Donju and their agents crossing and recrossing the border for business, a couple of thousand would successfully flee into China each year. Today, though, that figure has plummeted. From 1,047 known escapees in 2019, the figure in 2023 plunged to just 196. With the new infrastructure on the border, it's somewhat amazing it is even that high. And the worst part? Things may stay this way going forward. Right now, in the spring of 2024, the border between China and North Korea is no longer completely sealed. Official trade began to pick up again in 2023, and while it's still significantly lower than in 2019, goods are at least coming back in. Naturally, this increases the opportunities of smuggling for any Dondru whose network survived the crackdowns. Well, they can now re-emerge and bring food back in. Yet, the crackdown on black markets and economic activity remains in place. The border remains more heavily guarded than at any point in modern history. And while the outlet 38 North notes that the first tourist group since 2019 arrived in North Korea this February, it's almost certainly impossible for any North Koreans to leave. This, then, is North Korea in 2024, a place that has starved its people, shattered the markets that kept their hunger at bay, and consolidated its control over every aspect of their lives in a way that not even Stalin could have dreamed of. And for what? Also, Kim Jong-un can sleep a little sounder in his bed at night knowing that no power center exists anywhere to oppose him? It is a grim ending to a grim segment, and honestly, this is just the light version. If you want to feel truly miserable, go and read that full report from Human Rights Watch and Reuters. They'll certainly leave you feeling pretty damn hopeless. But that doesn't mean there isn't any hope left for North Korea. In an article earlier this year, the magazine The Diplomat noted that Kim's crackdown may ultimately backfire. In their words, the worsening economy and food shortages are rapidly spreading dissatisfaction with the Kim regime. Anti-regime sentiment among North Korean residents is growing, especially among the youth generation. Will those sentiments grow big enough to one day truly challenge Kim's rule? Well, we can only hope, can't we? And our second story today, we're going to turn to the country of Nigeria, where a wave of mass kidnappings has now seen well over 300 people at a minimum rounded up and taken to places by unknown jihadist terror groups in the country's northern reaches. But while Nigeria is no stranger to these sorts of stories, just recall April 2014's kidnapping of hundreds of schoolgirls by Boko Haram, this new wave of abductions involves at least one critical difference. This time, it's not just one abduction, it's a whole wave of them, coming suddenly after years of relative peace with massive implications for an internal conflict in Nigeria that shows no sign of stopping. The first attack came on the afternoon of March 1st, in an incident for which details are still hazy even a couple of weeks later. According to reports coming out of Nigeria's northeast, an unknown number of people, anywhere between 50 and 300, were taken captive near a camp for people who've been displaced by Nigeria's ongoing civil conflict. The hostages mostly included women and young girls and a smaller number of boys, although some elderly captives were allowed to return to their camp. Local organizations suggested that the hostage takers may have been members of a regional branch of the Islamic State known as the Islamic State West Africa Province, or ISWAP. Reports taken from a few girls who've managed to escape the gunmen suggested that the hostages had been taken far afield into the bush toward a village across Nigeria's border with Chad. In the days following the kidnapping, estimates on the number of people taken have coalesced around a figure of roughly 200, although an exact count remains elusive. If true, then it would be the largest kidnapping of women and girls by a jihadist organization in Nigeria since the 2014 Chibok abductions nearly a full decade ago. From there, the situation went from very bad to even worse. Hundreds of miles away from the location of the first incident, in a northwestern state called Kaduna, armed gunmen attacked a government-owned school in the town of Kariga. There, according to headmaster Sani Abdullahi, a total of 287 school children were taken hostage in a region where bandits have a long history of armed kidnappings for extortive purposes. By the time government forces arrived to begin searching the area, the hostages were already gone. This time, blame fell not on a jihadist insurgency, but on the semi-nomadic Fulani people, herders who spent decades fighting on and off with northwestern Nigeria's settled, mostly ethnic Hausa farmer population. The kidnapped children, including over 100 aged 12 or younger, were marched into the forest by the gunmen, and their whereabouts ever since, entirely unknown. 
A few students have managed to escape and give their accounts to local media. Said one 18-year-old Ababaka, quoting here, We trekked for hours in the scorching heat until we were all exhausted. A ransom note has since been issued to the families of the hostages, demanding a billion naira, roughly equivalent to 620,000 US dollars, with 20 days left to pay before the students and staff are executed. And even that isn't the end of it. As Nigerian security forces searched through the Kaduna state for the nearly 300 missing students, another town in Kaduna state, this time in the district of Kaori, was hit with yet another abduction. This time, in the early hours of Tuesday, March 12th, gunmen fired their weapons and moved house to house, ultimately abducting roughly 60 people before a security response drove them from the area. Just days before that, a smaller kidnapping went down in Nigeria's Sokoto state in the village of Gidembakusu. There, another 15 children were taken captive from a remote Islamic school and taken into the bush, where security forces are unlikely to be able to track them down anytime soon. Those additions would bring total estimates on the number of people kidnapped in the last several weeks closer to five or six hundred. And in one final attack, this time not a kidnapping but a massacre, a hundred or more villagers were killed across four villages by squads of gunmen on motorbikes. Those gunmen set homes and vehicles alight, and even circled back in one instance to kill people mourning the dead from their prior attack earlier that same day. Nigerian security forces were still conspicuously absent from the scene 36 hours later, while eyewitnesses attested that at least two men in military uniforms had been among the gunmen. Now, in order to understand these kidnappings, and even this massacre in context, it's important to explore two key factors. The nature of Nigeria's internal conflict and Nigeria's long and painful legacy of mass abductions. First, the nature of the Nigerian conflict, which isn't so much a single civil war or counterinsurgency, but more a mess of different armed factions looking to propagate ideologies, secure resources, or establish spheres of autonomous control. On the one hand, there's the civil conflict between Nigeria and the various jihadist groups. That element of the conflict has seen at least 35,000 people die in the northeastern state of Borno, where the first of those most recent kidnappings took place. Another 2 million people in Borno have been internally displaced. There, both Boko Haram and the local Islamic State affiliate maintain a constant and violent presence despite recent attempts to root them out of villages and drive them back to their camps. That element of the conflict has rippled into other Nigerian states too. Meanwhile, the herder farmer conflicts in northwestern Nigeria take place mostly between the herding Fulani people and the settled farming Hausa people in what essentially boils down to a land use conflict, but has grown exceptionally bitter as hundreds if not thousands of people have been killed in the last several years. Towns like Kariga, where the nearly 300 schoolchildren were kidnapped last week, have all but emptied out because of the frequency of eruptive violence and smaller scale but very common kidnappings that take place on local roads. All the while, the Nigerian armed forces haven't exactly carried themselves like the good guys either. In a recent episode on our sister channel, Into the Shadows, we've covered some of the Nigerian army's shocking atrocities against its local population, including even regular massacres of children. And then there's the question of mass abductions, which for ordinary Nigerians are nothing new. Nigeria's first mass abduction of this kind was one carried out by the jihadist insurgency Boko Haram in 2014, when about 270 students were seized from a girls' school in the town of Chibok. Boko Haram's motivation was pretty straightforward. The group's name literally translates to, quote, Western education is forbidden, and they were kidnapping the girls who were in the process of receiving a Western education, specifically scheduled for a final exam in physics on the day of the kidnapping. Once captured, they were forced to convert to Islam, forced into marriage with Boko Haram members, and held hostage for several years. Just under 100 of those girls are still missing today. But since 2014, mass kidnappings of this kind have become increasingly common inside Nigeria. Boko Haram carried out several subsequent attacks of that same kind, including an instance in 2018 that saw 110 schoolgirls taken prisoner. But they also became a tool of choice for a range of other bad actors inside Nigeria, including not just other jihadist and militant Islamist groups, but criminal gangs looking to hold their hostages for ransom. In 2020, a group of motorcycle-mounted gunmen abducted over 300 boys from a science-focused national high school, eventually releasing them after negotiations and an amnesty deal. In 2021, over 300 schoolgirls were kidnapped from a boarding school and released after a ransom was apparently paid. Four other kidnappings in 2021 saw an additional 200 or more students taken, most of whom were eventually released. But after July of 2021, the mass kidnapping stopped without warning or apparent reason, yeah. and they've been stopped for the better part of three years until last week. When it comes to these more recent kidnappings, it's unlikely that the Nigerian government will change its recent handling of the country's ongoing crisis. Despite the intense pain felt by Nigeria's rural population over the last few years, authorities haven't been able to take any substantive steps towards drawing down any of the country's individual conflicts. 
Even more concerning, they haven't seemed particularly inclined to try. Nigeria's governing officials are notoriously corrupt, and its military culture allows for incredible human rights abuses against its enemies, as well as cooperation with militant groups it perceives as allies. That cooperation includes turning a legal blind eye, even when those militants are engaged in wanton violence against their own adversaries. Security forces are typically slow or even reticent to respond to violence and kidnappings in the countryside. When they do, their public casualty counts often present a far rosier picture of the situation than what's actually happened, especially in instances where the government can protect itself or its allies by misrepresenting the truth. And on the other side of the conflict, Kidnappers have gotten better and better at hiding their hostages. Hostage takers are well accustomed to hiding from drones and aerial surveillance, moving through thick forest or across broad empty plains in small groups instead of escorting hundreds of hostages altogether. Those same captives can be used as human shields against aerial bombardment when government forces do close in, giving the kidnappers a valuable head start to abandon their hostages and leave the area. In the case of massacres, like the one reported this week, gunmen can disappear on their motorbikes long before government forces even catch wind of the incident, roving the landscape, returning to their hideouts, or splitting up if they need to travel in smaller, less trackable parties. When it comes time to ransom the hostages, the groups behind the kidnappings know how to game the system. While they'll often demand sums they know the families can't pay, for example, the equivalent of over $2,000 per hostage after the Kariga kidnappings, which is significantly more than Nigeria's annual per capita income, they know that the government is likely to pick up the tab. It's illegal for them to do so, of course, but in reality, that law is very easily ignored. And while the kidnappers know that they could face life imprisonment under Nigeria's anti-abduction laws, they know that they're not likely to get caught, and even if they are, they might still catch a slap on the wrist instead. On the grounds, authorities are working to track down kidnappers in both Borno and Kariga states, tracking the mobile phone numbers that the Kariga kidnappers used to make their ransom demands and blockading the stretch of forest where the Borno kidnappers are believed to have taken their captives. Abroad, international observers are cautioning that more kidnappings may soon follow, and that if the frequency and sheer size of these kidnappings keeps up into the future, things may still get a hell of a lot worse in Nigeria's rural areas. Other questions have since emerged about that very first kidnapping, around whether the 200-some people abducted from that displaced persons camp were abducted at all, or whether they'd chosen to voluntarily return to Boko Haram. Said one regional security expert, David Otto, quoting, The situation in the IDP camp is so dire, I am told, that a large number of women and some young men did not return to the camp and instead chose to return to the bush to live with their husbands fighting for Boko Haram. The whole kidnapping story is untrue. It was not a Boko Haram attack. Otto explains that version of events may have been a ploy by the Nigerian government, hoping to obscure the reality that people living in these camps face a worse fate than they would under Boko Haram. But while in some ways that would be a welcome development, that these 200 people may not be hostages, it also speaks to a very troubling situation in Nigeria where, like Otto says, a life on the run with Boko Haram would seem more appealing than life trying to get by in a massive refugee camp. But any conclusions from the kidnapping in Borno State, or we suppose the maybe not kidnapping, still can't be generalized across Nigeria, where other groups of people have been taken hostage by entirely different organizations and for entirely different reasons. Nigeria's displaced persons camps have gained a notorious reputation, and so has the Nigerian military itself for its conduct against not just insurgents, but people it believes might have some sort of connection or even just belong to the same bloodlines as the insurgents do. The country's relatively new president, Bola Tinubu, has seen his promises of regional security fall by the wayside. Not only are ordinary Nigerians losing faith in the government at higher and higher rates, but the country's recent national nightmare, mass abductions of schoolchildren, has become a reality yet again. According to another expert, James Barnett of the US-based Hudson Institute, the militants in the countryside, regardless of their affiliation, now believe that they can operate with impunity and that when they're challenged by the Nigerian government, the proper response isn't to back down, but instead make a show of force. In a situation like this one, escalation can very quickly turn into more mass kidnappings or even more massacres like the one that we saw this past week. Place yourselves in the shoes of a Nigerian civilian in the countryside. Would you rather see your government fail to respond to mass kidnappings, thus avoiding an even worse escalation? Or would you rather see them intervene, maybe bringing your own child home, but prompting the gangs to return in a few weeks or months, and this time with murderous intent? It's an impossible position for any person, for any community to have to face. And yet in Nigeria's rural regions, this is the sort of danger that has become a reality. And it's been a reality for some time. 
Whether this recent explosion of violence is a one-off event, or just the start of something much, much worse, we're just gonna have to wait and see. And finally today, we want to turn our attention to Nagorno-Karabakh and follow up on a story that we've previously covered. For our money, it was perhaps the most underreported story of last year, a region-defining crisis that was remarkable in its absence from most of the headlines. At 1 p.m. on September the 19th, 2023, the government of Azerbaijan unleashed a lightning assault on Nagorno-Karabakh, an ethnically Armenian shard of rugged mountain land within Baku's internationally recognized borders. Prior to the assault, Nagorno-Karabakh, known locally as the Republic of Artsakh, had been a de facto independent state for roughly 30 years. An unrecognized South Caucasus state born from the collapse of the Soviet Union, one Armenia and Azerbaijan had fought multiple wars over. Yet on that overcast September day, all that history came to an abrupt end. Unable to repel the larger, better-equipped Azeri force, the Karabakhi Armenians surrendered within 24 hours. As tens of thousands of civilians fled, the local administration signed a peace agreement that would see their republic dissolved on the 1st of January 2024. The story of Nagorno-Karabakh, it seemed, was over. Or was it? Because while the Republic of Artsakh itself may have ceased to exist, the story of its people and of its impact on geopolitics is not yet ended. Already in 2024, the ripple effects of the Republic's fall are being felt. So, this seems like as good a time as any that we do a follow-up to our videos on the subject from last September to explore what happened next. But first, just a quick primer on what exactly this conquered statelet was. Situated between the Armenian Plateau and the plains of Azerbaijan, Nagorno-Karabakh, in the words of The Economist, is a region of sharply folded hills of forests and gorges. It's also a region with a history of bloodshed, a land both ethnic Armenians and ethnic Azeris claimed as central to their heritage. In peaceful eras, that dual heritage meant the two communities living alongside one another. The Soviets made it an autonomous oblast to reflect its unique history, but then in a classic piece of Soviet dickery, they stuck it inside the Azerbaijani SSR. As long as the empire stood, this dual heritage caused few problems. Across the USSR, the region was famous not for ethnic strife, but for its locally produced wines. But when the empire collapsed, the contested nature of Nagorno-Karabakh meant both independent Azerbaijan and Armenia wanted it for themselves. We covered in greater detail the traumatic events that followed the breakup of the USSR in one of our earlier videos, so we won't rehash everything here. The short version is that both sides tried to ethnically cleanse the other, and Armenia won. This was the first Nagorno-Karabakh war, a war which saw thousands of deaths on both sides and ended with 700,000 Azeris expelled from the region as a victorious Armenia seized control not just of the Oblast, but of several ethnically Azeri provinces surrounding it. While Baku also expelled 200,000 Armenians from its own territory during this period, it was the exodus of Karabakhi Azeris that took root in Azerbaijani consciousness. That became a historical wrong society dreamed of writing. Nearly 30 years later, they got their chance. In 2020, newly rich with oil wealth and supplied with high-tech weapons from Turkey and Israel, Azerbaijan launched the Second Gorno-Karabakh War. Over 44 days, Baku seized not just the local Azeri districts, but ethnically Armenian regions in the lowlands. Although the fighting ended with a russian broken peace deal, it also left the Karabakhi Armenians nearly defenseless. According to The Economist, the unrecognized republic was left only with a handful of artillery pieces, tanks, and trucks to protect itself. With Russia providing the region's security guarantees and a peacekeeping force, though, it looked like this new status quo would hold. That Artsakh would survive in a shrunken form. After all, it's not like Moscow was about to go and get itself involved in a gigantic war that would leave it too distracted to carry out its peacekeeping duties, right? Look, although it took place over a thousand kilometers away, the Ukraine war was the death knell for Artsakh. Unwilling to alienate Azerbaijan's backer, Turkey, and unable to take the men and resources out of Ukraine to enforce Nagorno-Karabakh's independence, Putin seemed to have given a tacit nod to Baku to finish the job. Starting in late 2022, Azerbaijan blockaded the region, cutting it off from the Armenian mothership. After nine months, with Artsakh's population weak and malnourished, Baku launched its final assault. By September the 20th, 2023, the last defenses had crumbled. The third Nagorno-Karabakh war had ended with total Azerbaijani victory. But for the Karabakhi Armenians, the conflict merely marked the start of a new nightmarish chapter, a chapter marked by mass exodus unlike anything seen in decades. While exact figures are hard to come by, it's generally agreed that Nagorno-Karabakh had around 100,000 residents on the eve of its defeat. In the days following the One Day War, effectively all of them fled for the safety of Armenia. And we really do mean all of them here. Speaking to the Washington Post, a U.S. State Department official estimated that only 30 families chose to remain in their homes. Prominent Karabakhis put the number at a mere 21 ethnic Armenians. 
Everyone else ran. Some to Europe, roughly 6,000 to Russia, but the vast majority, including 30,000 children and 18,000 pensioners, over the mountains and into Armenia. Of those, 80% wound up in the capital of Yerevan and its surrounding districts. For a country with a population of under 3 million people, this was a massive influx. As Crisis Group wrote in a recent report, at least one in every 30 people now living in Armenia is a refugee from Nagorno-Karabakh. In per capita terms, that would be like 11 million refugees arriving in America in a handful of days, like the entire population of Haiti suddenly turning up on Florida's shores. And it's here that we get to the really grim parts of this segment, because Armenia doesn't have anything like the resources of the USA to deal with such an influx. And while society has tried to do its best for the Karabakhis, there are concerns about whether Yerevan can keep up its support much longer. First, let's talk about the positives. Crisis Group reports that Armenia's treatment of the fleeing Karabakhis has been compassionate. Each refugee has been given a monthly stipend of $185, equivalent to the Armenian minimum wage, as well as a one-off check for $250. Armenian citizenship has been made available for all, and efforts have been undertaken to find temporary housing. But, as the think tank noted, in its recent report, the government may already be hitting the limit of what it can afford. In Crisis Group's own words, the aid has strained the state budget, and it is not clear how long Yerevan can sustain the payments. The problems are similar to those facing any society that suddenly takes in a huge influx of people, a lack of housing, and jobs to go around. As we record this in March of 2024, many refugees from Nagorno-Karabakh are still living in public places commandeered by the state, empty offices, schools, libraries, or unfinished homes that were still in the process of being built. The plan is currently to try and give the Karabakhi Armenians the means to construct their own shelter. Yerevan is toying with offering each family with two or more children some $7,400 to build a home and put down roots in local communities. For an already cash-strapped state, that is extraordinarily generous. But it may also be the only option. The Crisis Group report estimates that there would otherwise be mass homelessness within four weeks of the government stopping the monthly payments. As for jobs, while an emergency scheme is temporarily paying employers to give refugees work, everyone knows that this isn't sustainable. One economist estimated that it could take over a decade to get all the Karabakhi Armenians into long-term employment. This is almost a mirror image of what is happening in Nagorno-Karabakh itself, now for the first time fully under the control of Azerbaijan. There, Baku is pumping crazy money into a construction spree designed to lure Azeris who were displaced in the 1990s with homes and jobs. $2.4 billion will be spent in 2024 alone, equivalent to 10% of Azerbaijan's entire state budget. Despite the area being contaminated with more than a million landmines, 140,000 Azeris are expected to move there by the end of the year. So, that's where things currently stand with Nagorno-Karabakh's people, with the refugees supported but facing uncertain long-term futures and the possibility of losing state aid in the next few months. Yet there's another dimension to this tale that we also want to touch on. The way the world has responded to the events of September 19th. Make no mistake, Azerbaijan's assault was a brazen display of force and a slap in the face to the global order. Baku had promised both the EU and America that it wouldn't try to conquer the territory militarily. Russia, meanwhile, had to sit back impotently as five of its peacekeepers were killed by Azeri forces. Given peace talks between Yerevan and Baku were underway, the sudden strike should have caused global outrage. That it didn't is mostly due to geopolitics. The Washington Post points out that America wants Baku on side as a bulwark against Iran. Europe, meanwhile, is using Azeri gas to make up for its shortfalls after Russia turned off the taps. For its part, Moscow wants to keep things civil with its frenemy Turkey, lest Ankara join in with sanctions against Russia. As a result, no major power with any sway has much incentive to do anything, with one notable exception. Home to a major chunk of the Armenian diaspora, France has emerged as Yerevan's most hardcore ally in the West. Just last month, Paris signed deals to ship Armenia new weapons and train Yerevan's troops. The hope isn't that French firepower will allow Yerevan to counterattack and retake Nagorno-Karabakh. Rather, it's intended to stop a further land grab by Baku, which is eyeing a route along the Iranian-Armenian border to Azerbaijan's own exclave of Nakhchivan. Both Baku and Ankara have hinted that if Yerevan won't allow a link to be created peacefully, they might drive one through by force. But France is hoping to use this influence to drag Armenia into the West's orbit. For years, Russia was Armenia's greatest ally, the country that backed it in the first Nagorno-Karabakh war and guaranteed its security through Yerevan's membership of the Collective Security Treaty Organization. Armenia's second largest city to this day houses one of Russia's biggest foreign bases. 
Since 2020, though, there's been a growing feeling in Yerevan that Moscow can't be relied on, that Putin failed to intervene to save Nagorno-Karabakh and is unlikely to protect Armenia itself against Azeri incursions. This growing distrust has handed Paris a once-in-a-generation opportunity to boost the West's standing in the South Caucasus. With Georgia seeking EU membership and Armenia desperate for new allies, the timing has never been better. The only question is, can Paris pull it off? With French military support still at a relatively low level and Turkey and Azerbaijan potentially eyeing a new offensive along Armenia's southern border, it remains to be seen if France's presence is any more effective than Russia's at keeping Yerevan safe. Still, while multiple things are uncertain, we remain convinced that this is a story worth keeping an eye on. Last year, the fall of Nagorno-Karabakh was the great underreported story, lost between coverage of the wars in Ukraine and Gaza. This year, its importance is only increasing. As the West, Russia, and Turkey all jostle for influence in the South Caucasus, it feels like the events of September 19th may have only been a prelude, the first sign of the great geopolitical games that will soon play out amid this stark mountain landscape. While the fate of Nagorno-Karabakh's refugees may have sadly been forgotten, it seems as if the story of the tensions that drove their exodus is still far from over.